Hello, I'm going to read a story by Cynthia Asquith called uh, The Follower. Um, to give her her full name, uh, Lady Cynthia Mary Evelyn uh, Asquith. And I'll just give um, a few words of biographical detail about her and her career, um, as this is the first time uh, that I've read one of her stories um, on this channel. I think it won't be the last. She was born Mary Charteris on September the 27th, 1887, and born very much into the aristocracy. Her father, Richard Charteris, was the 11th Earl of Weems, and her mother, Mary Wyndham, uh, was also part of an aristocratic family, very much involved in the government and the military. Um, and uh, Cynthia herself married Herbert Asquith in 1910, whose father at the time, also Herbert Asquith, was then the uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, no less, uh, uh, the leader of the Liberal Party um, at the time. Uh, she began her writing career early and uh, had a number of uh, close literary, uh, literary friends and acquaintances, including D. H. Lawrence uh, and L. P. Hartley, the author of The Go-Between, uh, and also very closely uh, J. M. Barry, uh, of course the author of uh, the Peter Pan stories. Um, she started working for Barry as his secretary, but remained very close friends with him until the end of J.M. Barry's life in 1937. And when he died, he left the uh, bulk of his estate uh, to um, Cynthia, um, except, of course, for all the revenues from the Peter Pan stories, which famously went and still go to uh, the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital in London. And in addition to her own writing, and it's very much for her supernatural fiction, that she's now remembered. She was also well known as the editor of The Ghost Book, which was first published in 1927 as The Ghost Book, 16 New Stories of the Uncanny. And uh, it contained work by, among others, D.H. Lawrence, Algernon Blackwood, Arthur Macken and uh, Walter de la Mer. And she also edited, uh, uh, to my knowledge, at least two further volumes of the ghost book, the second and third ghost books. This brief story, The Follower, um, was anthologised in uh, this collection called This Mortal Coil, being of course a, a quote from uh, Shakespeare, from Hamlet, Hamlet's great uh, soliloquy, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil. Um, the anthology was published in uh, 1947, and it's the very last story in the book, um, which doesn't mean anything, I don't suppose. Um, uh, Cynthia Asquith died in 1960 at the age of 72, and this is the follower. Mrs Mead referred to by the nurses as our heart case, had been in the nursing home with heart trouble for three weeks, and her doctor, to whom she had confided the terror that obsessed her, had at last persuaded her to consult the famous psychoanalyst Dr Stone. She awaited his visit in great trepidation. It would not be easy to tell him of her fantastic experiences, hallucinations her own doctor insisted on calling them. A quarter of an hour before the time when she expected Dr Stone, there was a knock at the door. "'I'm a little early, Mrs Mead,' said a smoothly modulated voice from behind the screen, and it went on with a little deprecating laugh. "'I, I must—' ask you to forgive my fancy dress. I've been 
culpably careless with a spirit lamp and am obliged to wear a mask for some time. As he approached her bedside, Mrs Mead saw that her visitor's face was entirely concealed by a black mask with two small holes for the eyes and a slit for the mouth. Now, Mrs Mead, he said, sitting himself in a chair close to the bed, I have had a, a long do talk with your doctor, and we want you to tell me all about this mysterious trouble that is thought to be affecting your physical health. Please be perfectly frank with me. When did this, shall I say, obsession begin? And, and what precisely is it? All right, Mrs Mead started off, speaking in a quick, even voice. I will try to tell you the whole story. It began years ago, when first I went to live in Regent's Park. One afternoon I was most disagreeably struck by the appearance of a man who was loafing about just outside the Baker Street tube station. I can't tell you how strong, how horrible an impression he made on me. Take your time, Mrs Mead. Take your time, put in the intent listener. Can you explain why that first impression was so strong? Was his voice sympathetic? She wished she could see his face. Constraining herself to speak more slowly, she went on. Well, I can only say that there was something utterly hateful about his face, with its bold, malignant eyes, lashless eyes that searched me like sharp, unshaded lights. He seemed to leer at me with a so there you are sort of look, and the queer thing was that, though I had never to my knowledge seen him before, and, as I say, his appearance came to me as a shock, yet it was not a shock of complete surprise. Well, how do you mean, Mrs Mead? Well, I don't know how to put it, but in the violent distaste I felt for him, there was a faint element of, shall I say, sub-subconscious recognition, as though he reminded me of something I had once either dreamt or imagined. I don't know. I remember vaguely noticing that he wore a black slouch hat and had no tie on, but a sort of greenish muffler round his neck. Otherwise his clothes were ordinary, though without any nameable malformation somehow he gave an impression of deformity. His face was horrible, moistly pale like, oh, like a toadstool. No, it, it, it's no good. I, I can't describe him. I can only repeat that the aversion he inspired in me was extraordinarily violent. As I hurried past him and went down the steps, I was conscious of his stare, and it was a great relief to disappear into the lift and be whirled away in the tube. Though I had plenty to do that day, I could never quite dismiss him from my mind and when I returned by tube late in the evening, it was a horrid shock to find him lurking at the top of the steps just as though he were waiting for me. This time there was no doubt that he definitely leered at me, and though he faintly, and I thought he faintly shook his head, it was as almost though, as it was all, apologise. It was almost as though he wanted to recall some forgotten or uh, 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 understanding or complicity between the two of us. I hurried past him, and soon I had that horrid sense of being followed, and I, I glanced over my shoulder, and sure enough, there he was, just a few paces behind, 
and as I turned, he, he slightly raised his hat. I almost ran home, and I cannot say what a relief it was to hear my front door slam behind me. Well, I saw him the next day, and the next, and practically every day. The distaste with which I recognised him became an absolute shudder, and each time his cynical glance seemed to grow bolder. Several times he followed me towards my house, but never right up to the door. I made tentative inquiries at the little shops around the tube station, but no one seemed to have noticed him. The dread of meeting him became an absolute obsession. Soon I gave up going on the tube and would make long detours in order to avoid that part of Baker Street. You minded him as much as all that, did you? Yes. Uh, go on. Don't let me interrupt you. Um, well, for some time, continued Mrs. Mead, I did not see him. And then there was a hideous incident. Returning from a walk in the park one day, I found quite a large crowd just outside the gate. A little girl had been run over. An ambulance man was carrying her small, lifeless body, and a policeman and some women were attending to the demented mother. Amongst all those shocked and pitying faces, suddenly I saw one vile, mocking face, its familiar features horribly twisted in a gloating grin. With positive glee, he pointed at the dead child, and then turned right round and leered at me. And after this horrible encounter, you may be sure, I shunned Upper Baker Street. But one day, just as I started to walk through the park, the heaviest rain I have ever seen came on, so I rushed to the taxis at the top of the street and jumped into the first one on the rank. In hope of a penny, a small boy opened the door for me, and to avoid getting my hat wet, I told him the address to give to my driver. To my surprise, we started off at a terrific pace. I looked up and saw a short, rather crouched back and a greenish muffler. The speed at which we were going was insane, and I, I banged on the window. The driver turned. Imagine my nightmare horror when I saw it was that awful man. Yes, the dreaded face was leering at me through the glass. Heaven knows why we did not crash at once. Instead of keeping his eye on the road, the creature on the box kept turning round to grin and gloat at me. Faster and faster we whirled through the traffic. I was so sick with horror that in spite of the appalling speed, I would at all costs have jumped out, but, struggle as I might, I could not turn the handle. I think I screamed and screamed and screamed. I was simply flung about in the taxi. At last there was an appalling shock. I can just remember the tinkle of breaking glass and the awful pain in my head and then blackness welling up. When I came to, I was in a hospital where for hours I had been unconscious from concussion. I began to ask questions, but could learn only that I had been picked up from the debris of a taxi which had crashed into some railings, and that it was a miracle that I had not been killed. As for the driver, he had unaccountably disappeared before the police arrived, and no one claimed to have seen him. The taxi bore no number and could not be identified. The police were completely baffled. After this, I insisted on leaving the neighbourhood and made my husband take a house in Chelsea. A nearly a year passed. I began to hope that I should never see him again. 
but I became ill, and after endless consultations, a very serious operation was decided on. Everything was arranged, and the evening before the date fixed, I drove to the nursing home with the sinking sensation natural to the occasion. I rang the bell, and the door was promptly opened by a short man. I almost screamed, in spite of the incongruous livery. It was him. There he stood, sickly pale as ever, and with that awful, evil, intimate smile. In a wild panic, I sprang back from the door and back into the taxi, which was waiting with my luggage. Directly I got home, I cancelled the operation. And in spite of all the Harley Street opinions, I recovered. The operation was proved unnecessary. Mrs. Mead paused in her narrative. The listener spoke. But then this... Um, being, whatever he is, on this occasion, may be said to have done you a good turn, he asked. Well, yes, answered Mrs. Mead. Perhaps, but it didn't make me dread him any the less. Oh, the, the ghastly dreams I had, that I had been given the anaesthetic and was thought unconscious, but I wasn't. I couldn't move, though. And I saw the surgeon approach, and as he bent over me, his face was the face. With a sigh of exhaustion, she leant back on her pillows. Did you ever see him again, Mrs. Mead? I'm sorry, answered the patient hastily. I, I can't tell you about the next meeting. It is still too unbearable. There are things one can't speak about. It was then, oh God, it was then that I understood why he had pointed at the dead child and leered at me out of his vile little eyes. That was a long time ago, but the dread is always with me. You see, I still have one child left. I am always looking out for what I so fear. I can never leave my house without expecting to see him. What if one day I should meet him inside my house? Oh, I do not think you will ever do that, Mrs. Mead. Well, I suppose you think the whole thing is an illusion, Dr. Stone. And in any case, I don't suppose I have been able to give any impression of what it, he, the creature, is like, sighed Mrs. Mead. The listener rose from his chair and leant over the invalid. Is his face like this? he asked, and as he spoke, he whipped off his mask. No one who heard it will ever forget Mrs. Mead's scream. Two nurses rushed into her room, followed by Dr. Stone, who, punctual to his appointment, had that very moment arrived. The dead woman lay on the bed. There was no one else in the room. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening.